What I'd like to do now is, is, uh, is introduce Yus Mita. Uh, Yus is, a, as I mentioned, one of the founding uh, fathers, executive director of the Lumen Institute. It's a long history in the uh, automotive uh, business. In 1984, he, he started his own business, uh, Mita Leasing. Um, he's been executive with, uh, with Penske and, and Chilton Automotive. Uh, he was formerly president CEO of HAC Group, which uh, formed had services in 19 countries. He sold that to Reynolds and Reynolds. He's now CEO of Acrista Vest LLC, which is a real estate developer uh, in New Jersey, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Sits on a number of public boards, but when you sit down and, and, and talk to, to use his, his energy and his faith is infectious. Uh, he is uh, an absolute fabulous guy. I've, I've talked to a number of people that work with him, and it, they, they consider it an honor to spend any amount of time with him because you just walk away feeling great. Uh, so Yus will, will talk to us a little bit about one of our 12 core values uh, called self-mastery. So please welcome Yus. Well, if you don't mind, Dan, after that introduction, uh, I think I'll just sit down because I don't know that we're going to get any better than that. Am I on for a recording here? Are we all right? Test, test. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Dan and the rest of uh, Lumen for having me here today. And let me just say that it's an honor and a privilege. And I have to tell you that Chicago has a very uh, deep place in my heart because uh, actually I lived here uh, back in the late 70s. In fact, raise your hand if you were here in 1977 and 1978. Okay, then you'll remember, they were the two worst winners in the history of Chicago. It hasn't been that cold since. We had, uh, I believe it was almost 120 days where it never got above freezing. And at the time, I was uh, newlywed, and just to give you a, a quick background, my wife Susie and I have been married for 30 years. We have five children, two boys, three girls and that's the order that they're in too. And our second son, Michael, was actually born here in Hinsdale Hospital. So uh, those of you who uh, know, just have some idea. Uh, and we lived out in the western suburbs and absolutely loved it here. As a matter of fact, I worked right at 100 South Wacker for the Chilton Company, which is an automotive publishing company. And uh, we were, like I said, we were here for almost three years. You talk about cold winters. I can remember shoveling my driveway and the snow would never melt. So it got to the point where I'd drive my car in, my wife wouldn't know I was coming in the driveway because the snow was so high it was over the roof of the car. So I don't know about windy, but it certainly was snowy here. And uh, it's always great to be back. I was talking to uh, Jack Murphy here at our table and Jack came from New York to Chicago. And I said, uh, what do you like better? And, and he started to talk, then he looked around the room and he said, Chicago. <laughs> But I can tell you, and I know some of you here are native New Yorkers, I happen to be a native Philadelphian. But we moved from Chicago to New York, and that was tough. I can tell you, that was tough, because you're moving from this clean, uh, you know, as they say, the Midwestern people are a tad friendlier than the Northeastern people. I can attest to that, and I'm allowed to say that because I'm from the Northeast, from Philadelphia. But that being said, it's just, it's great to be back here. I actually left Philadelphia in the uh, high 20 degrees and came here and saw the sun for the first time in a week. So it was uh, you know, just really uh, heartening to be here. So with that, let's talk a little bit about Lumen. I'd asked David, David Wilder, by the way, David is, uh, is our national uh, director of all administration and everything that goes right in Lumen, David's responsible for and does a phenomenal job. And all that goes right. That's, a, that's what I said, all that goes right. <laughs> and uh, I said to David, we had opened up our Dallas chapter, which was our first one a couple of years ago, and I said, David, do me a favor, would you? I want to do a refresher before we go to Chicago, so send me that uh, speech if you would. And I noticed in that one, it's all about formation, Father, I noticed in that one I spoke about 98% business and 2% lumen and faith. So where we are today, I'd like to turn that around a little bit and have more of the talk on faith and less on business. 
But let's face it, Lumen is a business-based organization, so I'll tell you a couple quick funny stories. Um, I was born in a bayou. No, I'm only kidding. I was born in, uh, outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and all my life I have two loves, cars and real estate. And I guess I'm really lucky in that regard because I knew from the time when I was a little baby what I wanted to do. I used to stand up in the back of my mother's car when I was five years old and I'd say, there's a 63 Chevy, there's a uh, 59 Cadillac. Because back then they had the annual model change. And every year the fins would go up, the fins would come down, they'd have single headlamps, dual headlamps. And it just became a great love of mine. My second love was real estate, mostly residential, but we do some commercial too. And my wife used to call me Walter Mitty because she'd send me to the Wawa, which is like a 7-Eleven store in Philadelphia, to get milk and cereal. And I'd come back about four hours later, so she knew that there was not a, um, a model home that I could pass in the car. I'd always stop, even though I had the kids with me, I'd say, you, Mike, come on, we're going to go ahead and take a quick look. So we'd run up there and so on. So those were my two passions and my two loves. And I was very fortunate. Uh, because I said to myself early on, and my family's been involved in the automotive industry for many, many years. And I said to myself early on, who do I think is the best in the business from a retail standpoint? And for me, it was a guy named Roger Penske. So when we lived here in, Philadelphia, in uh, Chicago, I was 24 at the time, and I sat down and wrote him a letter. And the letter was the gist was, Dear Roger, my name is Eustace Mita. I'm in the automotive industry, like you. Uh, I want to be a car dealer. And I said, I want to learn from the best, you're the best, so I'm coming to work for you. Now, it was very respectful, it wasn't harsh like that. I said, if I don't hear from you in seven days, I'll be on your doorstep. In a nice way I said that. <laughs> so what do you think happened? He, by the way, was headquartered in Philadelphia at this time. What do you think happened when I wrote him that letter? Oh, great answer, eh? What's that? He actually sent me a letter, and he said, Eustace, next time you're in the Philadelphia area, give us a call. Long story short, at 24 years old, I made it a goal, uh, became part of the Pensy organization, left three years later to go out on my own and made it another goal that someday Roger and I would be partners. 20 years to the day I left, left in 1979, and in uh, 1998, so it was 19 years, Roger and I became partners. And um, as a result of that, we also, I went back into the retail car business a little heavier, and uh, Roger bought a small company, um, became public, called United Auto Group, which has 300 dealerships uh, worldwide now, the UK, Germany, so on and so forth. So that's how I keep my foot in that part of the business, absolutely love it. The other part is a company called Acristavest, and Acristavest, um, you may have noticed there's something different about the name there, because the best investment we ever made was our investment in Christ. And the reason we say we is I'm talking about I, but you'll notice some different business philosophies too that we've picked up along the way. And at a Christ of us, we have a philosophy. And we say I is the least important word. Have you ever heard that before? Amazing. Reading the book, when I was in sixth grade, my father said to me, Yus, you don't seem to have a lot of friends, so I'm gonna give you this book. It was called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. <laughs> Now, his delivery was a little rough, but his intention was pure. I read that book, and I can still remember Dale Carnegie talking about when people write letters, how many times they use the word I. So to Christ of us, we say I is the least important word, we is the most important word. And it really creates a lot, of, it engenders a lot of teamwork, because instead of somebody saying, well, that's my idea, it's not your idea, it's our idea because we all have influence on each other. We all spark ideas from each other. So we say we is the most important words. We say the two most important words are thank you. It's amazing. Now I know in the Midwest you still hear thank you a lot, but where I come from in the Northeast, you don't hear thank you too much. So thank you are the two most important words. And we say the three most important words are would you please. Would you please. We say the four most important words are what do you think. And the reason that we say that is because oftentimes you'll find in a meeting and uh, in a uh, democratic society that we live in, some businesses, the CEO likes to run pretty much roughshod and is not interested in what anybody thinks. But we have found that for camaraderie and uh, for the betterment of the organization, 
just to ask those before you leave a meeting. What do you think? Frank, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? It's amazing what a difference that makes in people. Even if you don't want to hear what they think, it's nice to be patient and listen. We say the five most important words are you did a great job. You did a great job. And there's something in our business society today that people don't like to say that because well, we don't want them to get complacent. So we're not going to tell them they did a great job. They got to keep moving. They got to keep charging. We well, can keep charging and keep moving, but it's nice to give people a little pat on the back sometime. Last but not least, we say the six most important words. And by the way, these are words I have not been able to get my wife to memorize, but they are, I admit that I was wrong. <laughs> And it's amazing how freeing that is when we use that in a business environment or in a, in a, in a uh, family environment, in a home environment. And so it goes. That's our philosophy at Christovest. It's worked very well for us. Um, and even in this down market, you know, we've been able to be successful. I think the name has something to do with that. When Dan was up here, he talked about a couple of traits that uh, we emphasize at Lumen. One is called character, the other is faith, and the other is leadership. And I'm going to tell you two business stories real quick. One that shows how high you can soar and how you can have fun and whatnot. And then I want to tell you another one about hardship. Because in good times, you need character, faith, and leadership. In tough times, you need character, faith, and leadership. I'll give me an example. Back in 1998, and I think the uh, Wickstrom family will remember this, the internet, I guess, started in 96. It really started to become, uh, this is after Al Gore invented it, it started to become <laughs> more accepted in the business place. And we found people utilizing it. So we, uh, our company was called HAC Half a Car, Half a Car Group. And we had a company called Cybercar. And at the time, Ford Motor Company was uh, getting ready to award a big contract to train how to sell cars on the net. Because we said there's three ways you can go into any retail business, whether it's a car dealership or any other retail business, by foot, by phone, and now on the keyboard, by the internet. Well, as it turned out, everybody, as you can imagine, was very hot on this business at the time. Remember the year, 1997, 1998, right before 2000, when everything was up in the stratosphere. So Ford put out um, an RFQ, and seven companies responded. We were one of the seven companies. We happened to be, size-wise, the smallest of the seven companies. So we went out to uh, Dearborn, and we gave our presentation. And the next time, there was three left. So it was two months later, and there was three finals left. We were lucky enough to get on that list. The other two companies, you may know the names, uh, J.D. Power. Raise your hand if you ever heard of J.D. Power. OK, making sure everybody's awake. And how about Maritz? Have you ever heard of Maritz? Big travel, big incentive company. So the long and the short of it is we said, OK, now these companies, we know the retail car business, we believe, better than they do. But how are we going to convince Ford Motor Company that we're the ones? And we had already been doing business with Ford um, in other areas of the dealerships. So we came up with a plan. And we said, you know what? If we're going to sell to people on the internet, we have to have an internet department. Just like you have a parts department, you have a service department, we're going to have an internet department. So long story short, we built this model of what it would look like, what a little office inside the dealership would look like. And we built a miniature model within a dealership, and then we put plexiglass over it. So on our last presentation, by the way, you remember back then uh, Jack Nasser was chairman of Ford Motor Company, and Jack was very big on the internet. So we were getting top of mind awareness. We had a, our last meeting was in Dearborn in the boardroom. So we were in the boardroom of Ford Motor Company, which is where the presentation was. So they called me and said, Eustace, you're going to be on Friday. You know, this is the, was a Friday, and uh, the three companies, you're going to be on at 2.30. So I thought to myself, geez, 2.30, that's a tough spot. You'd rather be in in the morning. So I said, well, is there is any way we can move it up? No, the other, J.D. Power and Marit are in the morning, you're in the afternoon. So I'm picturing people being asleep and whatnot. So um, we get in there, 
And two days before that, I said to our guys, listen, we got to get out there early. We have to practice, 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 and make sure we have this thing down pat. And really, it's like the Lombardi principle. You remember, what was that famous saying, Lombardi? Does anybody remember it? What did he say is everything? Winning. He said winning was everything. But if you read his book, you would really know that what Lombardi said is the preparation to win is everything. So to prepare to win. So we said, we're going to get in there. We're going to prepare. So we actually stayed in a hotel across the street. Uh, I must admit it was the Ritz, but it was the closest hotel to uh, world headquarters. And at any rate, we got the Ford rate. So we were paying like we were staying in a Marriott. So we get in there, and for two days, we're practicing, practicing what this presentation is going to look like. Now, what I didn't tell the guys is that we had actually went out and produced a song to talk about what we were going to do. And the name of the song was Ford.com. Now, when I say the name of it, we wrote the song. So imagine their faces when this, the first day, the second day, before we begin for the presentation, and there was four of us, and I said to the other three guys, I said, now listen, you know, words paint pictures in people's face. Like if I say apple, you get a picture in your head. Some people might think the fruit, some people might think of the computer. If I say car, you have a picture in your head, whatever your favorite make and model is. So we wanted to make sure that we painted the proper pictures here. So I thought, well now, what's an upbeat song? Did you ever hear that song by the Tem Temptations, Can't Get Next to You? It's an old song in the 60s. Well, we changed the line. And by the way, I'm not a great singer or so, but I could hum a few bars for you. And uh, the beginning of that song, it goes like this. Girl will turn your gray skies blue. So we changed the words. When I say we, I'm talking about me, but we're so used to saying we. So I went into, <laughs> I went into a recording studio in Philadelphia, hired these four guys who sounded like the Temptations, gave them the words that I had changed here. So instead of girl will turn your gray skies blue, we changed the words to Ford will turn your gray screens blue. We'll connect the net whenever you want us to, okay, meaning the internet. So we had all these lyrics. So imagine this. Now every time when we got into the presentation, the first thing we said was we came to earn the business. Because remember, those, this is important you remember this. We came to earn the business. Why did we say this? because we wanted them to know that we didn't take anything for granted. We were coming here to earn this business. So they gave us 40 minutes for the presentation. We had the unveiling. It was funny because when we were going in, J.D. Power was coming out. And you can see they're trying to look at our model. And we had a, we had a black tablecloth over it. So we go in there, and we unveil the tablecloth. And the president of the company back then was a guy by the name of Jim O'Connor. And Jim was in there, as well as Daryl Hazel, who was uh, president of Lincoln Mercury. And there was 12. There was a whole, you know, they were all in this room. And I had gone in the boardroom uh, earlier that day and made sure that we had sound and CD and everything else. So we're 45, we got about 42 minutes into the presentation. Jim O'Connor looks at me and he says, Eustace, he looks at his watch and he says, are you almost finished? I said, Jim, we only need two minutes and 35 seconds, which is exactly how long the song was. Now, imagine this. Remember, we kept hitting the theme. We came to earn the business. And uh, so I said, lest you think uh, that we took this for granted, we even made a song up about how Ford's going to approach the net. It's called Ford.com. So they're looking around, as you can imagine. So the three of us get up. So now there's four of us. So the four of us are standing like this. And I had made the guys do a little dance ditty with me too that we, practiced, <laughs> that we practiced over at the Ritz. And one of our guys says to me, he's nearly in tears because we'd worked six months to get this business. And he goes, you, I can't believe it, man. He said, it took us six months. We're down to the last three. Now you're going to blow it for us on a song. <laughs> That's before he heard the song, by the way. So as you can imagine, here we are. The four of us are lined up. And then we handed out a piece of paper. And the paper had the words of the song on it, because we wanted them to know, not just to hear, because you know the subconscious doesn't work quickly enough. We wanted them to see the words to the song. And then we said, would you do us a favor and stand up? And would you guys do me a favor? Just stand up for a second. I'll tell you why in a minute. Do me a favor. Just stand up. OK, take a deep breath. OK? Take a deep breath through the nose and hold on to it. On the count of three. One, two, three. Hold on to it. OK, let out so. 
All right, one more. One, two, three. One, two, three. Arms out, because you got to get those lung expand. Arms out. Take a deep breath. <laughs> okay, let it out. All right, great. Now have a seat, please. Two reasons for that. A, to see if, make sure everybody's awake here. But B, we ask them to stand up, because when you want to get in, into people's thinking, when you want to move people emotionally, it's always best, as the father of American psychology uh, said, James uh, Allen, or William James, rather, is it move them physically. So we ask them to stand up. We get, now, this is taking a chance. Here you are in the boardroom. You're asking the presidents of all the divisions. So we gave out the song. And all of a sudden, we said, hit it. And you can hear through all the speakers in the ceiling, you go, Ford, we'll turn your gray skies blue. We'll connect in that. And we're dancing and we're turning around. <laughs> and then, I mean, we had it down pat. So then at the end of the song, all four of us get down on one knee and we go, Ford.com, because that was the last words in the song, too. Remember, we said we came to earn the business, and they were supposed to tell us in a month which of the three vendors got the business. At this point, Jim O'Connor jumps out of his chair and he goes, You got the business, Eustace. <laughs> so, amazingly, the rumor got out that HAC got the business based on a song. Now, you know that's not true. But the point is, when you get creative and you think of, you know, really what gets people excited, it's amazing uh, what you can do. And that song is still one of the top ten hits at Ford, even though they've, they've had some tough times, as Colin and the Wickstrom family knows here, but uh, it's still one of the favorites. So that's my fun story. Like anything, in life, you have ups, you have downs. So I could tell you some heartfelt stories, too, here of where we didn't do so well. But rather than waste time on that, I think I'd rather just get into the uh, three things that we're going to talk about here, character, faith, and leadership. And I would like to tell you one story about a company. Um, I started to tell you that we lived out here in Chicago. What I didn't tell you is, curiously enough, I have five children. I'm also one of five children. I was the middleman, too old or too younger. So that's my excuse. You know how tough it is being the middleman in any family. But at one time, the three out of the five children were out here. My brother Frank worked at First Chicago Bank. And we all happened to get out here within six months of each other. My sister came to work with me at Chilton Company. So we had a, we had a wonderful time uh, down here in, in the loop and whatnot. Like I said, I worked at 100 South Wacker. And my, my brother lived down here, my sister. So we just had a great time. We were all in our 20s. The reason I tell you that, because it reminds me, my brother worked at First Chicago. And uh, he went on and worked at different banks after that. But it reminded me of one story. When you talk about character, and you say to yourself, what is character? Well, character is really the makeup of who we are, isn't it? And by the way, who are we? Michael Jackson had that song, since we're talking about songs, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. And nobody knows except for God who we are more than we do. And character starts with thought. What are our thoughts? And there's thoughts that can bring us down into the dregs, and there's thoughts that can lift us up high. And another thing about thoughts is thoughts lead us to action. Like if you're having a bad thought, I'll give you an example. I was driving on the road the, uh, uh, last week. By the way, I wasn't the one having a bad thought. So I'm merging to get on the highway here. And all of a sudden, there's somebody in front of me. It's one of those merges. And listen, I'm not standing here saying I'm innocent. I'm a little heavy on the gas at times. But it happened to be this one day I was innocent. So this guy's hunking his horn at me, gives me a gesture. As you can see, I wear glasses. I thought he was saying, we're number one. <laughs> but as he, got, as he got closer to me, I could see that uh, that wasn't exactly what he was saying. I saw a sticker, and I just let him pass. I said, you know what, this is my lumen formation. I'm just going to be docile and let the man pass. And I wave and gave him a smile. Well, as he passed me, I see a sticker on the back. It says OLPH. And I know from living outside of Philadelphia, that's Our Lady of Perpetual Help. So you should watch what kind of stickers you have on the back of your car <laughs> if you're going to give those kind of gestures, because that bespeaks to our character. That being said, so thoughts create actions. Thoughts create actions and, and the way we work. And then actions become habits. Now, if you have good actions, they become good habits. 
if you have bad actions, they become bad habits. Whether it's, and by the way, we're not checking here today, but whether it's heavy gambling, heavy drinking, um, thoughts that maybe you shouldn't be having. In other words, looking twice, you guys all know what I'm talking about. Okay, as you're walking down the road there. But a great part of character, too, is self-mastery. And self-mastery is being able to really, how do you form your thoughts? And how do you form your actions? And how do you form good habits? And that's really what the genesis of Lumen is about. Because we found, when you look out there, and I think Dan mentioned Enron and Tyco and any number of companies, and I'm not picking on them because those were the ones that got caught. There's a lot of companies out there that didn't get caught. And the way Lumen started is we said to ourselves, if you look at these companies, how were they led astray? They were usually led astray by somebody at the top, whether it's a CEO or COO or CFO or a senior vice president or any one of us in the room here. Because you wouldn't be here today unless you had influence with other people. So you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, these guys are responsible for hundreds of thousands of lives and hundreds of thousands of careers. What happened? And if you listen to the CFOs and, and, and so on, they said, well, we just did what the boss told us. Well, that doesn't matter because if you break a law, you're going to go to jail whether the boss told you that or not. So we said to ourselves, if you look at an analogy, Mexico, for example, let's make an analogy here. Mexico, for many, many years, was communist, although 98% of the, of the country was Christian or Catholic. So you ask yourself a question. How could they possibly be when those two don't go together, the atheism of communism and Christianity? Well, the reason that that happened is because the 2 or 3% that weren't Christian is who was running the country. Let's go back to the companies. You can have 100,000 employees, but if you're leading them astray, look at the influence you have. Now, take it the other way. What if you have good formation? And what if when your CFO comes into you and says, you know what, Yus, we're having a hard time making the numbers here. Now, what we could do is we can take some sales that we know we're going to have uh, next month and bring them back into this month. In other words, rob Peter to pay Paul. Had you not had formation, meaning knowing what's right or wrong, how many times has that happened? And it's still happening. It's still happening. But that can affect so many lives. Or backdating of options. I'll be honest with you, I didn't know backdating of <laughs> options was illegal up until a year ago. By the way, that being said, I've never backdated options. You can check my record. Unfortunately, being on public companies, you know, Everything's on Google, so if you Google, you'll see it. I never did a thing with the options. But it gets back to that formation again, and that's what we talk about when we talk about character, and we talk about habits, and we talk about self-mastery. How about goals? By the way, I want to tell you the story of this one company. And I'm not going to mention the name because the company still exists, and they're a very successful company. But we just want to talk about philosophy for a minute. When this company first started, it started with 30 people in the financial industry financial meaning banking type of industry. And the leader there had a tremendous philosophy, and that is, if we put our people first, they will put our customers first. If we put our people first, they will put our customers first. So what he did is, they got their first building, and he laid out the parking, so the executives had the park furthest away. So the higher up in the company you were, the further away you parked from the building. Well, great philosophy. And they had tremendous sayings, and they, and they would, uh, you know, they, they, they would repeat their philosophy over and over. And it became a very successful company into the multi billions. But as they grew, and I watched this happen because they were not that far from us, and uh, again, I don't want to mention names, but not too far from Philadelphia. Well, as they got bigger, all of a sudden they got bigger buildings. As they got bigger buildings, all of a sudden the parking changed. No more were the executives parking out there. They had the indoor parking. They were parked the closest, obviously, to the door of the elevator. A little change in philosophy. Why? Goes back to character. And I'm not kidding, you know, by the grace of God, I'm not sitting here pointing fingers, but if you get up at 50,000 feet and look, you can look into our own companies and say, where are we with stuff like this? 
you know, where are we with, with being fair and whatnot? So long story short, they dropped, you know, the, 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 the highest up in the company got the best parking spots, got the company cars, got the, you know, the, the just incredible amounts of privilege. The company is still making money, but they have since been bought out, and the esprit de corps, it was like night and day. Night and day, because I used to walk the halls of that company. And I said, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, and I always loved having my own business. So very tough for me to be in the corporate world, because that's just my DNA, that's my makeup. But I said, if I was ever going to work in a corporation, this would be the place that I would want to work. Ten years later, I went back there and I said, you know what, you'd, ne you'd never want to be here if you were here ten years before because now you know the difference. And by the way, cafeteria, I used to go to their cafeteria because it was the best restaurant in town. And there was no such thing as the VIP cafeteria and the people's cafeteria. Ten years later, VIPs had their own cafeteria, you know, it wasn't a cafeteria, they had their dining rooms and then the, uh, you know, the people would eat in the cafeterias. So those are just some examples of how character can go astray. As for me, uh, in our philosophy to Christovest, I will tell you this. I didn't have some kind of, uh, and by the way, being in the car business, you know, that's a tough business because it's one of the few businesses where the price of the goods are negotiated. So every day you're faced with integrity issues, every single day. In 1988, how many years ago is that? 19. All right, just checking to make sure I haven't lost anybody. In 1988, I read this book, and it had 10 scrolls that came from over 2,000 years ago. And I'm going to tell you something. That book turned me on, changed my life, changed my life, changed my philosophies. And I'll tell you what the 10 scrolls were, and you may recognize the book. I'm going to give them to you quick here, so if you want to write them down or something, that's okay. But scroll number one is, today I begin a new life. And in the scroll it said, today I will shed my old skin, which hath too long suffered the bruises of failure and the wounds of mediocrity. Today I am a new man, and men shall know me not. The second scroll was, and this is an important one, I will greet this day with love in my heart. I will greet this day with love in my heart. Now here's an important part of that scroll. And who can refuse my goods that feels my love? My face they might reject. My clothes they might reject. But no one can reject the unseen force of love. I will greet this day with love in my heart. Scroll number three. I will be the master of my emotions. And this gets back to self-mastery again. I will be the master of my emotions. The tide goes in, the tide goes out, the weather changes. But henceforth, I will bring good weather into the marketplace. Because if I bring clouds and dark darkness into the marketplace, then the customers, my people, will feel clouds and darkness. Scroll number four. Anybody know what scroll number four is? Oh. All right, so you don't know the book. Anyway, scroll number four is I am nature's greatest miracle. No one, no one can duplicate my walk, my talk, my chisel mark because I'm a unique creature of God. And I'm not going to go through the last five, but I will tell you the fifth one. The fifth one is, I will live this day as if it is my last. I will live this day as if it is my last. And if it is my last, it will be my best. And how will I treat this day? I will look at my loved ones and say silently to myself, I love you. And say aloud to them, I love you. And if it is not my last, if it is not my last, I will get down on my knees and thank God at the opportunity for another day. I'm going to skip to scroll 10. This is important. Scroll 10 is I will pray for guidance. Read that book in 1988. Turned me around. Just had a tremendous influence on me. That's really what we talk about when we talk about character formation. What forms our characters are books we read, or people we become friends with. I remember back in the sixth grade when I was taking a beating with a steel ruler from one of my nuns. She would say to me, Mr. Mita, you better upgrade your friends. I'd say, sister, these are, you know, these are pretty nice fellas here. She said to me, well, show me your friends and I'll tell you what you're like. 
if you're hanging around with negativity and if you're hanging around with guys who are, you know, complaining about their spouses and talking about their girlfriends, you're playing with fire. You want to hang with people who are going to bring you up, not bring you down. And then we have to look in the mirror and say, are we one of the ones who are bringing us up or are we bringing us down? And then where are we getting? Where, you know, what books are we reading? Now you guys are here, so we're preaching to the choir. But this is another point of Lumen, is to be with like-minded people. Be with like-minded people. By the way, we're going to get to that when we get to leadership, because right now I'm only on faith. But I know time's tough, David, so don't worry, I'm going to move quickly here. Another thing is goal setting. I don't know why, but about 25 years ago I started to set goals. And I always had them, in fact, I have my book here, it's in my, even today I carry them around with me. And I always had them in four categories. Financial goals, meaning, you know, what was the company going to make this year? What was my personal income going to be? Could I afford a hair weave? Okay, <laughs> financial goals. <laughs> and then physical goals, what weight did I want to be? What was my workout so I have health and mind and body going to be? And then my relationship, my personal goals, my goals with my friends, with my family. And then last but not least, I had spiritual goals. And it was funny because I was looking back 25 years ago, and part of my spiritual goals 25 years ago were that I wanted to go to Mass three times a week. By the way, that included Sunday. So I would go Tuesday and Thursday. And that gets back to habits. We're all, we all have great self-discipline, whether you think you do you know, if you say, well, I really don't because I eat too much. We well, have good discipline. You have the discipline to eat a lot. But we're all creatures of our own habits. So amazingly to me, I'm looking back, and then the other thing was pray uh, once a day. And then fast forward now. I have my book out there, but this is after seven years with the Legion, and we started Lumen a couple of years ago, so two years with Lumen. And now the first goals, same thing, four goals, spiritual goals, number one. Because you know what? You can't separate them. You can't be somebody at work and be somebody else at home. You can't be somebody with your friends and somebody different with your children. You may try, but they can spot a fake a million miles away. A million miles away. Gets back to how are we building our character. So interestingly enough, and I don't say this to impress you, because it doesn't impress me, but today, when I look at my spiritual goals, Mass, seven days a week. And somebody might say, geez, that's great. You go to Mass seven days a week. And it, I don't look up piously and you know, start singing Ave Maria, but I go to Mass seven days a week because I need it to take the edge off me every morning. So that's why I do it. You may not need that. Another thing is a holy hour. And then one thing I found out, when you look at what's most important to you in life, is it making 100000 a year? Is it making a $1 million a year? Is it making $2 million a year? I still remember what I thought was the greatest financial benchmark in my life, and that's when I made $100,000 a year. So for the last two years, I've been feeling pretty good. <laughs> but the point is, what happens after that? Is a million more going to make you happier? Is two million more going to make you happier? No, whoever you are in your character is who you're going to be, whether you have a million or a billion. You're just going to be more of who you are, that man in the mirror. And that's the beautiful part about Lumen, because we stress that constant, take baby steps. I'll give you another example of formation. I said to you before, we have five children. And I thought, well, how can I bring them into my prayer life? Because now we're going to talk a little bit about faith here. How can I bring my children into my prayer life without them saying, by the way, let me give you their ages. My son, oldest son, Yus, he's 29. Unfortunately, he's in the retail car business. He followed that side of me, and he runs 10 dealerships um, in Turnersville, New Jersey. It's called the um, Turnersville Auto Mall. And uh, so he's gotten a lot of experience. My second son, Mike, 28. He's in Providence, Rhode Island. He's in real estate development. My daughter, Missy, first girl, uh, oldest girl. She's a school teacher, St. Margaret. She's 23. Julie, uh, our fourth, she is on a mission right now. She's in uh, Rome and Jerusalem. And number five is good golly Miss Molly. Molly is a senior 
in um, Murray and Mercy and her claim to fame is she's probably one of the fastest IMers, uh, you know, this side of uh, the West. I mean, you know that age group. But I thought, how can I bring them in? Because kids, you know, they look at you and, and they don't want to hear any phony baloney. So I said, you know what, we have five kids, so let's, let's have a, a day each one, each child gets a day. So Monday is the oldest, that's Yusuf's day, call up Yus. Went to Mass for you today, which helps me to go to Mass every Monday. Oh, by the way, set a, set a rosary for you too. Now, of course, they all have cell phones, so they see Dad's number and they purposely don't answer because it's usually like 7.15 I'm calling them. But that's okay because I leave them a message, I love you. By the way, today's mysteries were the most sorrowful. Our Lord died on the cross for you, so you don't be sorry, you be thankful. And then I go all down the line um, and it takes me up till Friday. And I tell you that not to, you know, say, geez, isn't that great, but whether you have one child or two child, try to bring them into your prayer life. You, you can't imagine the difference it makes. You absolutely can't imagine at times. Uh, times in your life. Um, excuse me. Times in your life where they'll bring it up. Our 23-year-old, uh, Missy, a month ago, was diagnosed with uh, thyroid cancer which is, if you're gonna get cancer, it's the best one to get. So she's since had her thyroid out, but the reason you know, I had to pause here for a minute was not because of the cancer, but it was because of what she said uh, to her mother and I, which was that Wednesday's her day, because she's the third oldest. Her operation was on Wednesday, and she said, isn't this a coincidence, Dad, that uh, Wednesday is the day you pray for me, here I'm having this operation, and uh, I just know God's going to be with me. So you never know where they're going to come up. But that's faith. And one of the things we talked about in character was goal setting and using goals. And I'd just like to say that one of the great things about Lumen is we have goal setting in Lumen. Just like you have business plans for your business, we have a business plan for the soul. And just like it's amazing how much time we'll spend on our businesses and hopefully spend time on our families, but how little time we'll spend on our souls. And if you believe like we all do in the circle of life, our humanity is this little tiny dot in the circle. So we were all focused here, and it's nice to have a focus there. So that's what another great thing Illumin is, is we're going to give you that business plan for the soul, and you'll get spiritual direction uh, from Father here, which I can tell you is beyond belief. And... Um, I mean, it just has a great ripple effect in your whole life. That book I told you about was written by Og Mandino. And as you can tell, I, I wrote, read that 20 years ago, and I still remember the 10 scrolls. But the great thing about Lumen is the formation you get. Now there's things I remember in the morning besides the scrolls. And it came from one of the great, my favorite prayer in the world, from the prayer of St. Clement. And it, it's a long one, so I'm only going to give you a couple short um, parts of it. But how about this? Lord, guide me by your wisdom. Correct me with your justice. Comfort me with your power. Defend me, or defend me with your power. Comfort me with your mercy. You know, those are, or as you're, as you're getting up or as you're driving home at night, how about you take another little piece of it? Lord, I offer you my thoughts to be centered on you. That's a big one. Hey, we just talked about thoughts a little bit earlier here, didn't we? And how they form your habits. Lord, I offer you my thoughts to be centered on you. My words to speak of you. My actions to do your will. That'll keep you from those gestures in uh, that, that van. My actions to do your will and my sufferings for your sake. Whatever our little crosses is. And everybody has crosses. I look at the cross and even say, you know, with Melissa getting cancer. And I say, Phew. you watch the passion last week and... Uh, you know, our crosses don't seem so big. They don't seem so heavy to carry. So that's when we talk about faith. We have another philosophy at a Christophus too. As far as success goes, work like it depends on you. Pray like it depends on God. I think the pray part's working pretty good because the boys are slacking off a little bit at work. Another thing is when we talk about faith is, how's our prayer life? Have you ever asked anybody that question? Hey, how's your prayer life? That isn't something you talk about. What do your numbers look like this month? You know? 
How are we doing? How many cars we get out? What are we doing in service and parts? You know, how are we doing on that deal with D.R. Horton or Poldy, you know, on the real estate side of our business? How about this? How about it, it's not courageous, but sooner or later you're going to start saying a prayer before a meal. You can't believe the impact that has on people. You can't believe the impact. Nobody's ever said to me, taking me aside and say, look, a prayer before the meal, stop, you got to cut that out. You know, the beautiful thing about a relationship with our Lord, this is another thing uh, we learned at Lumen. Unlike people who may not want to hear from you, again, I go back to my children. If they see my number come up, depending on their mood, they're going to answer their cell phone or they're not. But when you want to talk to God, whether it's by voicemail or email, He's always there. Our Lord has, He has no hold button. He never puts you on hold. If you've got to talk to him, you can, you know, look around, run to the men's room, get behind this curtain, but our Lord never, ever puts you on hold. There's no hold button for the Lord. Let's talk about leadership for just a minute here. Leadership equals influence. Leadership equals influence, because if you're a leader, you can't go out and pronounce to the world, I'm a leader. You'll know you're a leader because you have people following you. And you wouldn't be sitting at these tables, these tables here today unless you were a leader. And that doesn't mean whether you have 5,000 employees, 5 employees, 0 employees, you are a person of influence. By the way, think about the influence you have on your own family. Think about the influence you have on your own family. Some of the great leaders, and let's just talk about in the sports arena, John Wooden. Anybody ever heard the name John Wooden? You know, basketball coach, UCLA, probably still today one of the best of the best. 17 winning seasons, uh, 10 national championships, seven of them back to back. Even today, nobody's even come close to that. Seven back to back. I thought it was interesting in reading Wooden's book that one of his philosophies, no cursing, no profanity. Imagine that in the workplace. Raise your hand if you're in construction. That's, that's, part of the, that's part of the deal. You know, you can't be in the construction business without profanity. But you know what's amazing? Think about anybody you know who doesn't use profanity. They're the ones who stand out. John Wooden would not let his people use profanity. If he, even in practice, if a guy started, you know, he missed a shot and, uh, you know, he, uh, he started the curse, wouldn't go, all right, go get dressed. That's it. And it wasn't because he was a goody two-shoes, but he said it was that negativity. It's that negativity that goes through your thoughts and in your mind. And he says, I don't want any negativity on my team. No profanity. John Wooden, sharp, sharp guy. And as we said before, leaders, we can lead people astray or we can lead them to the promised land. You know, it's amazing. We have, uh, if you look at next Sunday's gospel, and next Sunday, this Sunday coming up, and by the way, it doesn't matter if you're, as you know, Lumen, we are not, um, you know, we're, we're open whether, you know, we have uh, Jewish members, we have Protestant, Lutheran, this is, you know, this is open to all faiths. But prayer, uh, as you know, is part of all faiths. But one of the things, uh, in looking at the Bible next week, it's where Lourdes says he appears uh, when they're fishing out there, and he says, children, have you caught any fish? And they've been fishing all night, and they're looking like, oh, come on. In Philadelphia terms, they'd be like, oh, come on, man, are you kidding me? And they said, no. He said, put the net on the other side. And they brought in, I think it was 153 fish. The interesting part, though, is when they get on shore, and they're sitting with them, Peter, he's, that's when our Lord says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And what's Peter say? Of course I love you, Lord. He asks him again. He says, Peter, do you love me? Of course I love you, Lord. Now Peter's getting a little bit irritated here. He said, feed my sheep. He asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And he said, Lord, now he's getting, he said, you know everything. You're God. You know I love you. And he says to him once more, feed my sheep. And I never really understood what that meant until this year. And as I look 
from here out to you guys and I look at all of the gifts and talents that you've been given. To become part of Lumen is to do our Lord's work and feed his sheep. And it can be all kinds of things. It can be saying the prayer. It can be asking a friend who's troubled about his spiritual life. And you know, there's another one, another, the parable about the talents. Raise your hand and remember that parable about the talents. Unbelievable. I don't know why. I didn't get that for like 45 years. And finally it dawned on me. I couldn't get why. Why did the guy who went out and buried the talents get a beat down? I mean, it wasn't like he lost it. I've lost some money in my life. All he did was bury the talent. And then it finally dawned on me. The talent that that parable is talking about is our talents. And if our Lord gave us the talents that he gave us, that's the your time is up alarm, excuse me. If our Lord gave us these talents, what are we doing to give back? By the way, have you read Rick Warren's book, Outstanding Book, Purpose Driven Life? Okay, raise your hand if you read that. I just want to get a show of hands. If you haven't, it's a phenomenal book, a very easy read. And uh, the first question that Rick asked in the book, which I love, is, what on earth are we here for? I mean, that's a great question. What on earth are we here for? We're only here on a short visit. For those of you who haven't read it, I'm not going to tell you the answer, because uh, I think you'll appreciate it once you get into the book yourself. But the point here is, I always say there's three plans. There's your plan, there's my plan, and there's God's plan. And all we have to do is go back to the man in the mirror and look and say, I know these talents I have. What am I doing to give back and be part of God's plan? And with that, I'd like to leave you with this one last philosophy that we have. And that is, if you go to work on a job, you'll make a living. If you go to work on yourself through formation and learning more about our Lord, you'll make a difference in your life and everyone's life that you have the privilege to touch. So God bless you and I thank you for the time.